Hi, and welcome to Scrumcast by Scrum Inc., a new series of conversations with thought leaders who have successfully helped transform organizations and empower individuals and teams across industries. I'm your host, Tom Bullock, and I want to start this inaugural episode with a quick description of what you can expect from these conversations. The world of work is changing. Organizations in every industry are transforming to become agile, and Scrum is the leading framework of choice to help them do just that. But for real change to happen, for transformations and businesses to succeed in a complex world, you need to go beyond theory. You need to understand not just the what, but the why and the how. And that's where Scrumcast comes in. We will bring you regular conversations with recognized thought leaders who share their real world experiences and the patterns and tactics and techniques they have actually used and have been proven to work in the real world of work. So we want to begin with a situation that we hear about again and again. It's one that deserves a deep dive, especially for any organization undergoing an agile transformation. Where do middle managers and those that manage products or projects fit in an agile organization? The answer is not as cookie cutter as some might think, as my two guests will explain. Dave Slayton is a principal consultant, coach, and trainer with Scrum Inc., and he has helped transform a diverse group of organizations ranging from large-scale manufacturers to financial institutions. Welcome, Dave. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. And also joining us is Avi Schneier, another of our principal consultants, coach, and trainer. He has helped transform organizations and empower teams on each of the six populated continents. Avi, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tom. Good to see you. So I'm going to start with kind of a definition of term. When we talk about middle managers, when we talk about this kind of project managers, it seems almost a nebulous term. What do we mean? So I think we, we want to distinguish the fact that product managers are not always middle managers. They, they may actually end up being quite often team members themselves or, or uh, at the equivalent. I don't like to use a lot of phrases around hierarchy, but when you consider traditional organizations before they switch to Scrum, there is a tremendous hierarchy of pyramid in there. And they're usually at the same level or like maybe just above, as opposed to the middle management layer that we're thinking about. So not necessarily... Um, not necessarily director level, but maybe whatever the company might have above that. So there's, there's this layer of managers in between senior management or the executives in the C-suites, as well as the people who might be just direct managers of the teams. And there's that, that layer of, there's that layer that sits in the middle. In some companies that may be directors, but in more often than not, it might actually be even above that. Dave, is that your experience as well? Yeah, I think uh, I'd, I'd actually float down a little bit below that, Avi. Um, so I think there's definitely the middle management layer, but I, I find a lot of experience getting down to the people who are right on the peripheral of the teams, like literally interacting with them kind of before and after the transformation, that they end up struggling with, hey, where, where do I fit into this? Because Scrum has three roles and uh, manager isn't one of them. And when we go in and we kind of start at the executive level, you know, people who are signing the check and really pushing to make the, the transformation happen, uh, there is a bit of distance in some cases between them and the people on the teams. Um, and the, what Avi described absolutely exists, but I find that uh, we can kind of grow it or help understand what's happening by starting with the people who are just peripheral to the team and working our way up just a little bit to the group that Avi described. Total, total, total agreement there. It's, it's, uh, it, it all depends on the size of the company and the number of layers or levels of management that you have. And I think what Dave hit upon that is the most important is that if, if you tell people everything about Scrum is in the Scrum Guide, the first thing that's missing is the word manager. There is a lot of word management in terms of management of backlog and things of that that you might be able to extrapolate, but there is no term manager and so one of, the, one of the first false studies or whatever you want to call it, for false myths about Scrum is that the product owner and Scrum master are a version of a manager. They, have, they are a product management role. They are, in my mind, they are a project management pair. But it is not a project manager and it's not a managerial role like that. 
So let's, let's dig in right there because as both of you are talking about, there are three recognized roles in Scrum, product owner, Scrum master, team member, and the product owner and Scrum master, because they are, or at least appear to be somewhat separated, some, you know, almost something of a hierarchy um, when it comes to teams it seems to be a natural fit for the middle managers, the directors, the project managers to go there. And that is a pattern we see again and again with companies moving these leaders into those specific roles. Is that a mistake? I think it can be. Uh, a number of times we'll go into organizations and a conversation where executive leadership is kind of saying, okay, so all of our project management office, our PMO group, uh, they're going to be the scrum masters or the product owners. And they're kind of asking the question. Uh, and it unfortunately, they may not know the answer, but they're looking for advice. The, the hard part is they're looking for advice to do a direct one-to-one -one mapping. So all of these people are going to become the, this role in scrum. And then all of this other group is now going to become another role in Scrum. The most common places that we see that one-to-one -one mapping try to happen is to take the project management office and move them in the Scrum Masters and take your business analysts uh, sometimes and roll them in in the product ownership role. Uh, and there's, there's times when those translations work well. But again and again, and Avi, tell me what your experience is in this place. What I found is um, you might get started in that way depending on how the organizational culture is, is in set up currently, but it really ends up being a case by case basis of who's going to fit uh, in the right role, uh, especially when we're kind of uh, closer to the bottom where some of the management uh, team leads or functional leads or whatever kind of local copy uh, name you'll give to them uh, are potentially going to contribute uh, in the team space. Avi, what's your experience been there? You know, this is a great, this is a great topic. Uh, so Tom, I would say the first mistake that we see has nothing to do with Scrum. The first mistake that we see is just very common in business, right? You got a sales team, somebody's an awesome salesman. They automatically promote that person to sales. Yep. And nothing could be stupider because you basically took the person who was the best at selling and took them out of that role and put them in a role where they will no longer, possibly, because obviously some sales managers still sell, well, they will possibly no longer be selling directly and instead they have to manage a bunch of salespeople. That does not mean that because you sell well that you have the ability to manage people who sell. Yeah, it's a separate skill set that everybody assumes if you succeed in this path, you can manage the path. But yeah, and that's something we see all the time. And it's the same thing, let's say even software development, just because I'm an awesome, you know, just because I'm an awesome Python programmer, it doesn't mean I'm awesome at managing people who happen to type, you know, right, who code in Python. That, that Those two skills are not, there's no, there, there maybe there's a correlation, but there is no causation. Let's just say that. So a lot of times I think that the defect is if that's the way the organization has traditionally been run, then you have people going into a role, for example, like product owner, where they're supposed to be able to speak to customers who clearly have no ability to. And that is, that's a huge breakdown. Now, what Dave said is the other breakdown that we see is that people are confused with what do we do with the PMO? Now, Dr. Sutherland is very clear here that the PMO does not necessarily have to go away. There is a way to transform it. Uh, at one of our clients, one of the largest retailers in the world, they turned the PMO, they turned the PMO into, instead of project management for office, into a PAO, a project acceleration office whose job it was to now accelerate projects by understanding Scrum in the Agile world. Now, you can call it an Agile PMO if you want. You can call it a PAO if you want. You know, Roseman, the name smells as sweet. But it was an understanding that something had to be different. At some companies where we go to, the PMs instantly become Scrum Masters. At other companies we work at, the PMs instantly become product owners. And as Dave said, nothing could be a bigger mistake because each one of them has a different personality trait that is required to do well. It's something that is not really learnable. For example, from the product owner perspective, we always say it's decisiveness. And we all know people in our lives who are decisive and people who are not decisive. That's not something well, you can teach. Let me, let me step in and be decisive in this way real quick, Avi. Let's go through point by point, roll by roll, key characteristics. But I also want to clarify two things. PMO, Project Management Office, you made reference to that before. And Dr. Sutherland is a reference to Dr. Jeff Sutherland, who is the co-creator of Scrum, founder of Scrum Inc., and uh, co-signer of the Agile Manifesto. So 
he's the guy who's been there through the creation of it all, I have to say. Now, let's get back to these roles. <laughs> let's get back so to for, these so roles. For product owner, yeah. So for product owner, it's definitely decisiveness as a, as a personality trait that you've got to have to choose between what's valuable, what's not. Let's, let, let's start with something to really help people understand, though, is even those, even people who are familiar with Agile and Scrum can lose sight or don't can, can sometimes not fully understand the role of the product owner. So let's, instead of talking about the characteristics, let's begin by stating what they are responsible for so we can see how the characteristics flow from that point. So the right, product yeah, owner I, is I, responsible I like for. Yeah. yeah, let's do that, Tom. So the, the product owner is fundamentally responsible for guiding the team in the direction of choosing what outcomes and accomplishments the team needs to contribute to the business bottom line. So, and, and stemming from that uh, is going to be decisiveness to choose the direction that we're going. Uh, that decisiveness should be predicated by knowledge of what it is the, uh, the business needs, whether it's internal stakeholder delivery, whether it's external market interaction, this product owner needs to, to have, or at least be strongly uh, inclined to expand their domain knowledge so that they understand it. And here's another place where I think a lot of product owners uh, kind of fall down because they know business domain knowledge really well, if they are in, in that space, they actually shy away from understanding the team's capability and the team's, uh, how the team can deliver talents and actually are. Uh, and if we go back to uh, some uh, like the software example that Audi was saying before, when, when we put the wrong people, somebody who is a great salesman or a great technical person, when they get into the role of product owner, sometimes they know what the team can and can't do inside out, but they shy away from understanding the market because they don't necessarily have the skill set to talk to uh, the, the people, the stakeholders, uh, because they're they're more of a technical upbringing. Uh, so I think that's where I would start, Abby. I'd start with uh, we, we need somebody who is decisive, but that decisiveness needs to be predicated on, you know, knowing uh, what needs to be done because, you know, both the domain stakeholders and the people who can contribute. Uh, but Abby, I know you're a big fan of the business side. So how would you weave that uh, expertise into the conversation? You know, it's about it's about not making the decisions inside your own head. It's about not making the decisions in a vacuum thinking that you know better than your customer does. You know, it was a common mistake. I used to work on uh, Wall Street. You're familiar. I used to be in the stock market. And it's a common, it's a common mistake that people think, I know better than the market. The, nobody knows better than the market. The, the market will teach you very, very bad lessons if you think you know better than it. You know, I always think of that movie, The Perfect Storm, how, you know, the movie about going fishing, like, oh, I, I, it's going to be okay. We're going to go. The weather's not going to be there. Now, the market will teach you your lessons just like the storm will. And, and, and product owners have to understand that they don't know better than their customers. And unfortunately, it's a common scenario that we see that, you know, I think I know better than they do. And that's where the business side really has to come in is that the product owner is the liaison, the known stable interface between the team and the rest of the world whether the rest of the world is another team or in the company at large or particularly the customer. And in that way, they have to be customer experts. That, that's the actual psychological side of Scrum on the product owner is getting inside your head and understanding what makes them say yes, what makes them want to click buy it now, whether, whether you're selling it or, or it's an internal product that makes them want to use the internal solution versus whatever thing that, whatever junk out of the box thing that we had previously purchased. It's all about the psychological aspect of understanding what makes our customers tick and what makes them want to use our product and how they're going to, how's it going to help fulfill their needs. So both of you are talking about some characteristics that can seem intangible at first. How, if you're working with a client, if you're partnering with someone, what do you specifically look for and say, ah, that one, that one's going to be a really good product owner. That one, not so much. Dave, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start by building on something that Avi said. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge it. Uh, I don't want to say challenge it just a little bit, but I want to show a different side of the coin, which is Avi saying we need to the customer thinking and what click, uh, click buy or whatnot. I think there's, a, there's another piece of that puzzle, which is we all know a lot of people who, 
who are very well informed with what the customers want. Customers or stakeholders will come to the product owner and say, I need this, this, that, and the other. And we can't ignore the fact that some of those requests are just stupid and selfish. And we need to be able to prioritize the, the vast range of things that are being requested of most teams that we encounter. It's very rare in, in this day and age where I get to work with a team who literally supports one work product stream. Generally, they've got two or three or four or five projects going on. They've got five different stakeholders who don't care about what the other stakeholders want. So being able to prioritize across disparate areas becomes one of the real, the real skill sets. Uh, so if I use that to kind of lead into, you know, I'm having a short conversation with a group of people and being able to eyeball somebody, it's when I ask them, hey, what is it that you do? Or what is it that your team is responsible for? Or give me a sense of your world of work right now. If they can summarize it very concisely and very clearly and have confidence in the direction that they're going, and then bonus points if they can actually tie what they're doing to the direction that the overall company wants to go, then I know somebody who can see uh, both the near term, the midterm, and the far term horizon. And if they can communicate it well, that ability to communicate becomes a real key piece of the puzzle. I think, uh, and Avi, let me know what you think here uh, from, from your experiences. I talk to a lot of product owners who are actually really, really good. They see an incredible vision. The problem is it's all up here and it looks like this when it comes out and the team right. doesn't know how to respond to it or digest it. A hundred percent. I've seen it countless times. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, and the actual customer and there are layers in between them, which might be that middle management layer or it might be, for example, a marketing layer. Uh, you know, I work with one of the largest brewers in the world and more often than not, the people who make the beers don't actually speak to the people who drink them which means often they're making products that end up dying in the marketplace because they think everybody wants it because somebody else has it. Like they're trying to make a, a competing product to what's in the market, but they don't do enough demographic research on their own. And as a matter of fact, they're not actually doing it. There's some market insights, consumer insights division that does the research. But the problem is, is that they never hook up directly with that product owner. It's just they feed them reports. They don't ask the product owner, hey, come on site and come talk with us. Because that, that person who actually makes the product may have very different questions. Not like 100% of them. You know, they may have very different questions or different angles of asking those questions to, about, to get that feedback from the person to actually deduce, oh, wait a second. They say they want this, but because of what they're describing, the way I'm imagining, it's actually more like this. This is actually, or, or even the physical constraints, this is what we actually can make. And so in that way, they get a better understanding of the heartbeat of the market. And so one of the, and this is a big thing, Dave and I talked about this years ago, but one of the biggest dysfunctions that we saw was that product owners were actually not talking to end users, another layer in the company that was doing that and then translating that to them. And so that whole game of telephone is a breakdown. It's great to have marketing people. They're awesome. They do fantastic work and to you know, aggregate massive amounts of data. But if the product owner, and, and why not the rest of the team even, if they're not going along on some of these ride-alongs, you can call it that, right? Ride-along, you can call it sure. focus, you can call it whatever you like. If you don't allow the product owner and the people, the team will actually make this product, whatever it is, whether it's consumer packaged goods, their software, go with the marketing team to try to actually understand the customer better. All you're doing is creating a breakdown of communication that results in substandard products. Let me, let me pile onto that, Avi, because I think you said something really critical. And Tom, I want to point this out for the, the question that you asked, which was specifically, what characteristics are we looking for if we're kind of looking at a person? Uh, and the second one that I would look at would be inclusiveness, not a product owner who's kind of, yeah, I'll handle all of the customer talking, but a product owner who understands that the closer they get their team to the customer, then the more the team will be able to execute and make contextual decisions without having to have the customer on the phone at every uh, selection point along the way. What, what Dave is saying is very key here. Uh, uh, when we started working with the biggest companies, one of the hardest uh, transitions that they had to make was moving away from the traditional RACI chart, responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And this is all over the place. You know, When people switch to Scrum, one of the, hard, one of the things they go with most is what are the clear delineating lines of a role and responsibility? Sure. 
Because yep. in Scrum, actually, there's actually quite a bit of fuzziness. But there's quite a bit of, bit of fuzziness for a reason because we want accountability from the team. So is it only the product owner that ever talks to the customer? The Scrum Master should never speak to them, the team members? That's not what we're talking about. We're saying that there is very clear accountability. Product owner has to understand what the customer wants. Product owner curates the product backlog. But that doesn't mean that everybody doesn't help. It's not a, I want you, I want to be very clear. It's not a hands off attitude. The idea of scrum comes from rugby. The ball gets loose, it's hands on. Everybody jumps in. That's the difference between how we work versus how the traditional world works. Everybody jumps in, all hands on deck. Everybody goes for that ball. So yes, the product owner has to curate the backlog. Absolutely, that's their role. That's what they're accountable for. Mm -hmm. That does not mean the team members don't write backlog items. That does not mean the scrum master doesn't help figure out ways to, to, to help the product owner communicate the vision more effectively. It's a team sport. Yes, there are roles, but there's a blended helping of, a helping of each other. That, that goes across them all. So I want to go back to our premise here too, uh, as we move to the next role that we'll dig deeply into, which is the Scrum Master role. But our premise here is where do middle managers fit in an agile transformation? That's our core argument here. And I, the conversation we've had on product owners is fascinating. But it's time, just since we're trying to figure out this whole middle management question, to move into our next role, specifically because product owner, they own the what, right? The vision, as you both have kind of explained it. But the Scrum Master is a weird nebulous role. It's very confusing to people who aren't familiar with Scrum, um, at least at the beginning. Uh, but it's absolutely critical to the success of teams and organizations. So the Scrum Master, you talk a lot about this being, you know, a lot of people t coming from the project management office, the PMO, into being a Scrum Master. Let's start here by saying, what is the responsibility of a scrum master? What are they responsible for? Uh, so I, I love the scrum master role and that's how my journey in scrum started uh, back in like 2012, I think is uh, eight years ago. Uh, and, and by figuring out kind of how to bring scrum to a team and the fundamental role of scrum master is exactly that figuring out how to coach a team to get to a place where the framework is working for them. Uh, and that they're continually accelerating. They've adopted a continuous improvement mindset and, and they can coach the team through basically getting work done in a better way. And that is kind of yeah. just fuzzy, right? Because we're, we're taking people and telling them, oh, you're the scrum coach now for a team. Uh, wait, what? How does that relate to anything that I've done before? Uh, and so I think there's, there's one thing from the project management mindset that translates really well into the scrum master role. And that's looking at data. Like, where are we? Uh, how, how can I make this visible? They're, they're accustomed to seeing where things are either on a schedule or on a budget or a number of risks or whatever kind of goes into your regular status report. And Tom, we could have a whole separate conversation of how to make status reports disappear for a scrum team because that's... Sure. Uh, more than we can have time for today, I think. But the project management mindset is very good at kind of taking all of this information and making it visible. Uh, and now if they translate that to making it visible, not just to upper management as a report, but also make it visible back to the team, the team can respond to it on a sprint by sprint or even a day by day basis if they do it well and we can uh, tap into that at the daily scrum. Avi, I think I interrupted you. You were about to jump in. No, 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 Dave, perfect, it was great. Um, what, I would add, what I would add is this, Tom, because you do want to bring it back to an understanding of where does management fit. So now we understand the product owner does this, the scrum master does that. To me, the answer, it, it comes, and, and I know we're talking about scrum, but we have to remember that when you're talking about management and you're talking about large groups, we're actually talking about scrum at scale. Because if we're talking about scrum, we're talking about a single team, and you're right, there is no role of manager because you shouldn't need you shouldn't, need, you shouldn't need someone to tell eight people how to figure their, their own thing out. That's what the product of the Scrum Master for. There is no need for a manager. But now we're not talking about 18, we're talking about 100 teams, 200 teams, 2,000 teams. Now here's where management comes in. So it isn't, it isn't necessarily a product owner or a Scrum Master role. It is the scaled versions of those. Chief product owner and Scrum and Scrum Master. This is where we're going to the middle management fit in the best. 
And, and you brought up a very important point, Tom, about what are the duties of a Scrum Master and how does that fit with management? So <clears throat> let me just give an example of what I do in my leadership workshops. As I tell them, look, there are three things here. Awesome products, awesome process, awesome people. And I know you care about all three, but you can only sign up for one. And I actually draw like a chart. Mm -hmm. And the goal is, is at the end of the day, they've got to put their name in one column. Now, if they put their name in awesome products, obviously they're going into the product of the world. If they put their name in awesome process, they're going to go into the Scrum National Society organization. And if they put their name in awesome people, there's actually a role for that. It's not, it's not an established role with a title and snack, but it's generally like a functional owner. So like the old, you know, whatever, the old director of UX, the old VP of sales, that is still a thing because the three things that we have in Scrum, right? We have, we have what from product owner side, we have how from the side, we have facilitating the process from the scrum master, but then there's also this notion of the discipline that how, who makes the discipline better. This is where management really fits. What's funny is that when you do this, you figure out, it takes a little bit of time, but you figure out that you don't need as many people deciding the what as you thought you did previously. Mm -hmm. The what is actually probably the clearest thing to figure out and you need less. The how, that's what you need the most people figuring out because that's where we need the innovativeness and the process, we need people to help. This is where manager, managers shine because their actual job of management is to help people connect. It's to help everybody make these connections, this cross team coordination and collaboration that we so desperately need when we have more than one team delivering. So I think managers fit very well, obviously into a chief product owner role, if they know about product, if they know about the market, and if they actually speak to anybody outside the company. But I see them fitting very well into the Scrum of Scrum master role, for everybody to coordinate, and they fit obviously best into a function on the role. This notion of, hey, I'm still gonna help lead this discipline, but the difference is what they do. There's a great article from the HBR. Uh, we'll have to throw the link in the- you know, That's Harvard Business Review. In the Harvard on, on how much money we've been wasting in America on management practices. And I wanna, I wanna tell you the summation of the article. It's not that you should just fire all the managers. That, that's not what it means. It's that we've spent a lot of money on low, low value ad management activities versus high value ad management activities. And some of those low value ad management activities are things like uh, these old 180 uh, performance reviews or micromanagement of the teams, whereas high value management activities, making strategic decisions, helping people become the best at whatever discipline X it is, the best mechanical engineers, the best UX designers. If I'm, if I'm the sales, if I'm the best salesperson, and now you want to make me sales manager. It's not that I should manage them in every micro micromanage everything that they do. It's that I should help them all become better sales people. And in that sense, the manager's job is the creation of and spreading of whatever best practices, or as we like to say in Scrum, better practices, because you're never truly at the best. We want, that's the manager's job to figure out how to standardize and spread those from team to team to team so you're not wasting time reinventing the wheel. That's agile management. Tom, can I, uh, can I throw in, uh, so if, if you've met me before, or if you meet me again, you'll realize that I love to talk uh, more with drawing pictures. Uh, mm -hmm. Avi, can I, can I draw a picture? Uh, so see if we can pull up the, the whiteboard here. Sorry to create uh, technical, technical issues. You're fine, Dave, uh, no worries. So I, I look at it, uh, I think what Avi described, uh, I, I'll, I'll start with a single team centric view. Uh, and, and Avi, lives, I think we have an amazing amount of overlap here. Uh, which is, uh, if, we look, if we look at a team-centric view, so um, I'll start here. So this is the team. And, and this is one of the mindset shifts that people struggle with is that we're kind of a team-centric view now in Scrum instead of a bunch of people going around and doing different projects, we're actually bringing work to a team. So Avi, you said uh, three things. Your first one was awesome products, right? So if we, look at, uh, if we look at awesome products, I look at that and I visualize it this way and I refer to it as strategic direction of the company. Right, kind of where are we going? And this is the real decision making, um, kind of what it is that we're going to accomplish. And I think Avi's absolutely right. Uh, when you're in a, a standard corporate environment, you think you need hundreds of people to make these decisions. The reality is when you untangle it from the other two pieces of the puzzle that Avi described and that I'll, I'll show here in a second, uh, you find that you actually don't need that many people. In fact, too many cooks can spoil the pot. 
uh, or any other variety of translations of that to, that, that you can go with. So the second thing I've said is you need awesome process. Uh, he also referred to the scrum master side of the organization and the product owner side of the organization from the scrum at scale perspective. So if I look at uh, awesome process, what I think of and what I visualize is we want to make the team's pathway to deliver value for the company as smooth as possible. Uh, the analogy that I'll commonly use is when we go into organizations, it's often kind of a four wheel drive, bumpy dirt road. And with uh, scrum training and a little bit of coaching, like literally inside of two months, we can have a team tuned up to be operating like a high performance sports car. But if we're gonna take that high performance sports car out of the garage, and they're gonna drive on a four wheel drive, bumpy dirt track, uh, then it's not gonna go very fast. So the awesome process, very much akin to the organization needs to sort out all the garbage and friction and issues that they've got that keep people from actually being able to do their job. The impediments, uh, yeah, everything that's slowing them down. TPS cover sheets, yeah, TPS cover sheets. Anybody remember those from, uh, from the Office Space movie? That's, totally. A tiny but a very effective example of just stupid stuff that people waste their time doing. Now, the third and sometimes um, harder place for people to realize that they actually thrive, but when they do realize they thrive here, uh, we can find a huge amount of value and their ability to contribute, and that is awesome people. So if we have some folks who are, uh, say they've come from a very technical background or they enjoy mentoring, uh, or they, they want to make sure that their professional um, charges, like all of the mechanical engineers or all of the whatever the prof single profession is, who are now distributed one or maybe two amongst the teams, we want to make sure that they are up to speed with the company standards, up to speed with industry standards, that they're all kind of talking from the same playbook. Now we need somebody over here to kind of say, all right, how do I make sure that everybody on the teams under my profession is as good as they can be? How do we continue to grow them? And this is where the professional development, which often gets forgotten or gets uh, deferred or delayed or deprioritized because we're always so busy doing everything, either scrum or not scrum, it's, both, it's a problem. Uh, this person ends up playing a very key role, in my opinion, which is they're going to now start to connect to the product owner because we have a product owner for each team. Now, this person can start to lobby the product owner to make sure that there's time and resources available for the team members to actually continue the professional development and be as awesome as possible so that all of our focus going to value output we also now have a balanced, a check and balance system. And you'll start to see this throughout Scrum on regular occasions, product owner, Scrum master is one. Now we have awesome people versus value. That becomes a relationship that some middle managers who are great at uh, promoting and supporting great people, now they can make sure that that gets recognized and included in the Scrum paradigm. So I have to ask, if we talk about this from, you know, the product owner cycle or the business analyst side, the scrum master cycle or the project management side, the, you know, mentoring, human resources development, that function. To someone who, I would understand how someone would say, well, okay, are we just taking the roles of middle management and giving them different titles and it's all really just smoke and mirrors? No, 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 we're not. Because what we're actually doing is trying to figure out what, what, uh, what parts of the middle management job are actually waste and tossing them off. And then we're actually spreading some of it to the team. So uh, in, in the class, we've commonly played this game project. It used to be called project uh, uh, manager to project leader, but I changed the title to project manager from role to function. It's really has to be an understanding that the project management is not a person when it comes to scrum. It is a function. And that function is spread out amongst everybody. And that includes management and, or leadership. So leadership has certain things it has to do. Middle management has certain things it has to do. The product owner has certain things they have to do. The scrum master things they have to do and the team has things. All of the sum total of that is product management or project management. That's the sum total of it. It's not a person, it's a function. And so it's about spreading that out. 
but it's it's not about relabeling it actually at all. It's 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 quite the opposite. It is also understanding what we're doing in the system that's wasteful and just literally chucking that. You know, as Dave was talking about this notion and you mentioned the idea of impediments in this path, it's kind of like it's kind of like the job of management is to pave the road, right? The job of leadership is this is to say, hey, here's the new road we're gonna take, right? The team is the one that's gonna build this high performance car and get on that road. But management's job, middle management's job, is to pave that road, make sure that road is paved so that, that the teams can operate smoothly. That, that's a, 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 to me, that's incredibly clear, and it's not a relabeling. You know, there are, there are certain frameworks out there that actually operate or exist only because they relabel. Mm -hmm. And that's not agile. That's fragile. That's, in Australia, they called it wagile, waterfall and agile together. It's like this, it's like this, this horrible mishmash of, what, what we used to do and what we could do. And it creates a system that just limps along, you know, and we, we want to create as a real high, high performance system. But you do create, you know, according to, the, according to the rules in the Scrum Guide and then creating your own playbook, your own custom fit for how it works inside your company. So that's another thing management has to do is figure out that playbook. We give you the rule book, right? It's given away for free since 1995. But the playbook, that's what management has to craft by being careful observers of the teams and seeing what is getting in their way, how do we clear it, and how do we make this better going forward every single day? Yeah, let me, let me jump on there, Avi. I, I like your uh, automotive analogy, and I, I wanna make sure we don't forget uh, making sure there's gas in the tank. That's another oh, piece of the yeah. puzzle, right? And that's the, that's the association with making people awesome or yep. giving the team the resources that they need. Yeah. Uh, and Tom, if we kind of take a step back and we bring it to, to looking at the umbrella of our overall conversation, which is uh, middle management, I don't think we're just relabeling. I agree with Avi. I think one of the things that we're actually doing when you kind of spread it out in the way that Avi described it and then I like to, to, we're actually helping people who are in that space, kind of that, that middle area who are now supporting the teams to actually focus. I think a lot of times we have middle management and they've got, I got to do this. I got to do, I got all this stuff. I got a project report. I got to help my people. I got to do my 360 reviews and like how many people love the annual uh, employee review. It just becomes, uh, except for a select few who actually genuinely thrive in those conversations, it becomes just another thing that we have to do in the few spare minutes that we have between doing work. But if we kind of recognize how all of those fit in and we see where the product ownership side of a scaled scrum implementation is all about strategy and direction. And we see how the scrum master side of a scaled scrum implementation is all about process and delivery and efficiency. And as Avi said, and I think this is a really key element, paving the road for the teams to deliver. No longer checking on the teams. Hey, why haven't you done it yet? Now is, how can I help you do it faster, easier, smoother, more fluid, so on and so forth. And then the final piece is you find those rare gyms who are all about mentoring, helping people, professional development, like their, their eyes shine when they see other people succeed, then those are the people who are filling in the gas tank. And if you can focus in an area that allows you to not be scattered all over the place, now you start to get some of the results that come from the basic common sense of quick context switching. Do something great at the expense of doing a lot of things good. Dave, Dave has hit the proverbial nail right on the head. And it's a great, it's a great question. How can I help you? We, we don't think about it all the time, but we should. You know, one of the things that I think Dave and I have seen in common when you get a scrum team that's running really well is that at the daily scrum, instead of them saying, this is what I did yesterday, this is what I'm going to do today, and no impediments, the, the the more common question is what I've, I'm already finished with this. How can I help you finish what you're working on? This notion of swarming, everybody working together. So the same way we want to hear that question, how can I help you in the team daily scrum, is the same thing we want to hear from managers when they are looking at, for example, whatever KPIs they have given to judge the team by. It, it, KPIs for scrum should not be used to praise or punish. They should be used to focus, management to focus on what coaching or what assistance can I lend to this team so that they can be as high performing as possible? That's the idea is management has to go from, hey, what are you doing to, hey, how can I help you? That's a, that's, that is an essential change in agile management. And it's a significant one too. Oh, yeah. So gentlemen, we have talked about product owner. We have talked about scrum master. 
We have talked about scaling and of course, all this through the lens of where do classic middle managers define very broadly, where do they fit in? The one role that we haven't approached, which can be as, which is as important, in fact, it may be the most important role period, is the team member. And for some middle managers who go, again, from an, in, a, in a hierarchical situation, you know, they're up here, they have teams down here. If they suddenly find themselves being reallocated to a team, they can feel or see that as a demotion, as some kind of punishment, but that's not sure. the case. No, not, not at all. I mean, look, in, in Scrum, whether it's Scrum at scale or something, three things. What are we making? Facilitation and making the thing. That, 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 those are the three things we need done. And sometimes these managers, we've actually had managers who went back to being, back to being team members and actually enjoyed it because that's actually what they missed doing. I remember, yeah. I remember a mechanical engineer at one company we were at who was thankful that we adopted Scrum and he went to being a team member because he got back to mechanical engineering, opposed to managing mechanical engineers, which he actually had no aptitude for and no desire to do, but the company made him do that because he was the, he was the oldest, he was the oldest uh, person in the group. He had been there the, the most number of years he had the seniority. So it, it's like, it's nuts, you know? It, it's not a demotion at all. It's, it's, it's proper, I, I don't like to use this term for people, but it's proper resource allocation. It's proper, I would prefer the phrase, it's proper talent management. It's putting the right people in the right place. And some places when they do, when they do a transformation, and you can read about these online, is they throw a light switch. They fire everybody on Friday and they rehire them on Monday into scrum roles. This is, this is a false success. You can read about these projects out there. There's a lot of false success out there with this. It's a misunderstanding of, of it's not just what should you be doing, it's also what do you want to do. And we have to take that voluntary army approach. It's really, really to put people where they want to be. It's really important. But that doesn't mean, by the way, that, that managers aren't team members. They're also team members of management scrums. So they are team members too. Sure, absolutely. And especially as you scale up, you know, removing impediments is something we've talked about kind of anecdotally, but if you can, if, if you are the person, if your team rather is the one that's responsible for removing the roadblocks that are slowing down a major project or a team success, that is a shared success for everyone. That's the organization pushing forward. And you having a hand in that is a great feeling. It's, it's that, you know, the work matters as opposed to I'm doing stuff that no one cares about that doesn't really matter. It's, it, it, it means something. A hundred percent. I mean, part of management job, management's job is to clear out the impediments, which the teams cannot take care of themselves. You know, let's say, let's go, you know, let's go for a hardware example instead of software. What if you have attending uh, pieces of automobile equipment or some type of heavy manufacturing equipment and they don't have the proper uh, in, uh, injection uh, molding machine, right? Well, the, the budget for that might be many hundreds of thousands of dollars. That may not be in the purview of that new design team's budget. So the scrum master has to know who to go to. And then whatever manager they go to, they've got to go to, that's management's job is to figure out, okay, where are we getting those funds from? Who's writing that check? What budget is that coming from? So clearing out, clearing out those impediments that the teams cannot handle themselves because they are beyond their budget or their political power, that's management's job to do that. And that is the most important thing that they do. Because again, that's paving that road that lets the teams develop as fast as possible. Yeah, so Tom, I'll, let me jump in here because I know uh, you, Avi gave kind of like the positive example of having uh, an engineering manager who's like happy to get back to engineering, you know, necessarily or enjoy the people part of the puzzle. Uh, there's definitely times when uh, people do feel like it's a demotion. Uh, and this becomes a real change management piece of the puzzle and a challenge. And so I think if we take a step all the way back to when we're doing any sort of a transformation uh, of an organization, change management becomes a real piece of the puzzle. Um, you're going to have the outlier success stories where people are so thankful because their life has changed overnight. You're going to have a bell curve of people who like come up the curve quickly. Other people are like, okay, I see where this is going. And then you're going to have people like, like, I just don't understand how I fit in. What do you mean I'm back on a team? Because I had all of this territorial turf 
and, uh, and, you know, power that I'm now losing and I'm just being one of a half a dozen people on the team, it might be a challenge. It might very well be a challenge. And, and we need to find ways to uh, help them understand that their role for delivery is going to be different and that we need to adjust our incentive plans and the way that we benefit people uh, or reward people for their behavior so that it's not, hey, now you're on a team doing this where you used to be in charge of 40 people, but we're still gonna incentivize you based on the way that we used to. Sure. We now need to look at things, and uh, I think Avi and I have seen an example of this in, uh, in a company that we worked with in upstate New York, that they, uh, they, they took that to heart and they changed the way that people who had a lot of tenure in the organization were able to be rewarded for sharing their knowledge mentoring and bringing people up even as part of a person in one team they got rewarded for the better that team became with the knowledge that they used to be the only ones that had they actually would get spot bonuses and things like that along those lines and that drove them to then become uh more i guess per pervasive not only with their team but with other teams of sharing their knowledge and they had the same realm of power. They had the same uh, tribe that they got to hang out with and, and be a central figure in. It just kind of took a little bit of time for it to, to feel that power in a different way or feel that influence in a different way. I think power is probably the wrong word, Bobby. Uh, I don't know. I think power is an okay, an okay word to use there. You know, Dave and I, Dave and I teach a really interesting class here at Scrum Inc. It's called the Licensed Agile Coach class where we actually talk about change management much more than we do in our regular classes, which are about how to do scrum technically. And we talk a lot about here about what, what are the things that prevent, uh, why people are resistant to change. And one of them is, he mentioned that one of the top ones is loss of territory or loss of control. And it's not just perceived in, in that it's fake, it's, it is real. And that can be very, very threatening to people because you know, Dr. You know, Dr. Eli Goldratt taught us very early on, show me how you measure me and I'll show show you how I show you how I behave. If I'm bonus to build my empire inside the company, the minute you start taking people away from me, I'm losing financial incentive. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really recraft the systems, the bonusing systems under which these things exist. Uh, we're working on this right now with one of our top clients, again, one of the largest uh, consumer packaged goods company in the world and large brewers in the world. And they're recrafting their targeting system, how they bonus people. Because the CEO who I had the fortune of speaking with, you know, he came to a workshop and he was, he was convinced. He's like, he's like, wait, he's like, this is great. He goes, but he's like, what are the problems? And we, we told him that in all of our leadership workshops, one of the things that the people attending recognized was going to be the biggest impediment to the organization changing was their targeting system. So he had me come into headquarters, a very specific meeting to say, you got to help us fix this because I don't want the targeting system to be why Scrum or Agile fails. If it fails because it doesn't work for us, that's a different story. But I don't want us to be the one that holds it back. And so they actually worked last year towards the end of the year to pioneer a new targeting system. And again, back to the volunteer thing, we didn't push it on everybody. We asked anybody who had been trained who wanted to work in an Agile way, we told them you could adopt this different version of targeting system for yourself. And we had a lot of people take it. Uh, we're getting the initial feedback now because it's a quarterly review cycle, so it'll come in soon. But again, we're, we're, we're being agile about that too. So we're taking, we're, we're not just doing it, we're also getting feedback on it, and then we'll iterate it in the company going forward. But I see really positive things happening this way from the preliminary data, which is that you do have to change the way you bonus people. And by the way, who figures that out? That's right, Tom, middle management. So another role that they have is helping to figure out what are the procedures and policies we're going to put in place to make sure we understand the KPIs placed on individuals, teams, and the rest of the company to judge whether or not we're actually going in the right direction. Dave, do you have anything to add? Uh, you know, the thought that was just uh, going through my head, Tom, was uh, we started having a conversation about middle management. And then Avi and I, are, as we are tend to do, We'll dive into any any swimming pool that we see along the way. So, uh, I, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it back to you to kind of make sure we're still in the structure and that uh, that what we've all said, uh, Avi and I have said, actually makes sense in the context of what you were trying to accomplish here. Uh, no, you guys have been great. I really do appreciate it, gentlemen. The premise of this conversation, the premise that we began with, is 
where does, it's a question, where does middle management fit in, in an agile organization that's using Scrum? And the answers that you've given us, I think, are pretty thought-provoking in the fact that they can still fit in, in in many ways, very similar positions to where they are now, that really what it is, it's not about a change in the organizational chart. That will happen, but the key components here are a change in the mentality and removing that waste of management to allow managers to focus on things that actually are more productive for the team and the organization and get more done, get more out the door, improve outcomes, which is the point. So the final question I have for both of you gentlemen is this. If I was a middle manager and I was, a, I was just told that my position as it was is gone because the organization that I work for is going agile, what is the, the most important thing you would want me to walk away with at that moment? Dave, let's start with you. Well, I was hoping you were going to start with Avi. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, 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 I'll jump in here. Uh, and so it, there's a lot of context that I can put into assumptions here, Tom. And one is that, uh, that I actually get to have a conversation with the person. So I'm going to kind of picture myself in, like they're coming up to me because I'm part of the, the transformation mm -hmm. team uh, and consultant. And they're saying, uh, hey, man, I'm freaking out. Yep. You guys are terrible. Look what you've just done to me. Uh, and then fundamentally, it is uh, where I would take them through a conversation is, hold on, you're, you're still here. Your, your title has changed, uh, but your employment has not. And really understand, hey, where, where do you fit in the spectrum of strategy, problem solving or supporting people and, and kind of like give me some examples of where you flourish. And then I guarantee you will find the spot that, that you get into there. So what is the one thing that I would have them take away is that they are still valuable to the organization. Their time and tenure is unique and specific uh, and that there is a place. There's definitely a place. We, we just need to adapt the way that we think about it into a team-centric world instead of a individual-centric world, Avi. So I, I'm, I'm in the exact same place. You know, when I, when I deal, and, I, and I've had this conversation actually quite often because uh, Dave and I deal at leadership, being principal consultants, we tend to deal a lot at the leadership levels before the rest of the transformation goes down or even during when the wall goes down. And I end up having a lot of these conversations. And one of the things I'll, I'll tell them is, look, and it's very similar to what Dave said. I'll tell them, in a scrum transformation, you have job security, but you don't have this role security. That, that's what it comes down to. And then what I like to do is I like to try to take them back before they were a manager and say, what did you really love doing here? What did you love doing here? Was it, was it building X? Was it helping the team work better together? Was it mentoring the new, the new folks that came in? You know, when I was a, when I was a stockbroker, uh, one of the things I loved doing was taking the in, helping them become stockbrokers of the Series 7 examination. So I became like a mentoring stockbroker. As much as I was on phones, I was also doing that. It, it, it's about finding that passion that you have for the work that you do and then turning that into what scrum role fits that piece. So if you're passionate about making stuff, Maybe you go back to the team, or if you're passionate about talking to customers, then you're going towards product owner side or chief product owner side. And if you're passionate about the process, about getting everybody to work together, which a lot of product managers are, they're very passionate about helping everybody put all the pieces together so mm -hmm. it fits well, th then Scrum Mastery might be for you. You might need to take a class to learn a little bit about servant leadership, which is a, a style uh, 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 like you said, uh, a mentality, uh, an approach you would take towards, towards being a scrum master, but that may be where you fit best. That whole idea of coordination and facilitation, which requires the, they commonly call them the soft skills. I don't like that term because it, they're really not soft. They're, they're the human skills that are needed in order to help people work better together. It's, it's very common to have six people sitting at a table agreeing loudly with each other. And the, scrum, the scrum master's job, and in that sense, the scrum the scrum's master's job or whatever manager's job it is, is to help those people really hear each other and synthesize each individual idea into something better, some better unified whole that brings more value to the customer, more, more revenue to the company, and greater job satisfaction for those people who do the work. That's the manager's job. 
Avi Schneier is one of our principal consultants. Dave Slayton is another one of our principal consultants. Gentlemen, thanks very much for the conversation. Enjoyed it, Tom. Tom. Thank you. And for patterns, techniques, case studies, and more about successful agile transformations and the empowerment of both individuals and teams, uh, visit our website, scruminc.com. And while you're there, you can also see how you can partner with us to make sure that your organization does achieve better results starting now.